I am here. Hi, here. welcome Hi there. everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. Alicia, we have 192 people so far with you here, and I imagine the numbers are going to go up, and you are welcome to begin, and welcome, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this lovely welcome, and uh, thank you, everybody who is here. I am very happy to be talking with you and trying to share some of what we've learned so far about what it's like to parent under stress and how we can help young children get what they need to thrive in these dangerous and uncertain times. And I'm going to ask Gal to go from one uh, slide to the next. So um, just know that I will be saying Gal, the next one, thank you. One thing that we've learned is how important it is to keep track of the basics. I think one of the things that stress does to us is that it discombobulates our thinking. And having a conceptual frame that we can return to for guidance as a North Star has been very helpful to us in retaining a sense of purpose and clarity and mindfulness as we work with parents and children who are traumatized and who are doubly traumatized by the current stresses of COVID-19. We need to remember wonder. We need to remember that children continue to develop, they continue to engage in the joy of discovery about themselves, about the world, about each other, that they continue to rely on their parents and their loved ones for support as they move on to make sense of what is happening around them. And we need to continue fostering joy, pleasure, protection, safety, even in the small moments of everyday life, now more than ever, because in the pleasure of connection is where the energy to surmount these current obstacles will be. In the next slide, we're going to see that along with the wonder the previous one, please. The, along with the, the, with the wonder, we continue to have the normative anxieties that begin in the first five years of life and continue to be our lifelong faithful companions into our old age. And they are the fear of loss, fear of separation, which now, of course, becomes more acute with the fear of losing loved ones to the disease, the fear of losing love and approval, which becomes more acute as nerves are frayed and people are forced to live in very close quarters and the regular routines are disrupted so that everybody needs to adjust very quickly to new situations and new challenges where we sometimes react with impatience and with even anger so that conflicts increase. And with the conflicts, the fear that that basic foundation of love remains unchanged. The fear of body damage, of course, the fear of illness, and the fear of being bad, of not living up to the expectations of society and to the expectations of ourselves. All these anxieties begin in the five first years of life and they continue with us and they get played out right now more than ever in relationships between the adults in the home and in relationships between parents and children. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. And along with that, we continue to have 
the the next slide, please, Gal. Yes, I'm trying. It's not working. I moment. see. Okay, these are the glitches that we experience constantly. Here it is, and then the glitches get repaired. Thank you, Gal. Uh, in telehealth sessions, which is some of what we're going to be talking about today. But again, as part of the basics, to remember the normative parental functions, protection from danger and the question of how do we protect from danger? How do parents protect from danger when there is an invisible enemy and it seems to be ever present? How do parents provide caregiving when there are so many urgent demands that are pressing on parents and the daily routines that they relied on of childcare, for example, are disrupted. How do parents provide supportive socialization when everything is challenged and children are asking for things that the parent might not be able to provide and siblings get on each other's nerves and everybody is clamoring for a kinder, wiser, more mature parent and the parent, him or herself, wishes he or she had a wiser, kinder, more loving adult. And how to give the child a sense that life is valuable and meaningful when parents themselves are asking themselves those questions. And that leads us to the next slide, which is that reality continues to matter. That the first three years of life continue to be the most dangerous in the child's life. The first five years of life are dangerous and these dangers confirm the anxieties, the normative anxieties of I will be left, I will be hurt, I can't be loved, I am bad. You have all heard probably the reports of the really significant increases in domestic violence as adults are in the home with each other without the safety valves that everyday routines, going to work, going to school, having contact with family and friends provide. There is also a worrisome decline in reports of childhood, uh, child abuse, which seems paradoxical in the context of the increases in the reports of domestic violence. But from many child protective services, both in the Bay Area and around the country, we are hearing that the reports of child abuse have declined and there is a concomitant worry that this is because children are not seen they are not in school, they are not going necessarily to their primary care uh, uh, appointments, and they are not seen in public um, places. And so there is now a worry that there will be a second wave of COVID-19 related illnesses in the form of stress, related illnesses and in the form of child abuse examples that emerge after children go back to the public sphere. This takes us to the next slide, which is the specific concerns that COVID-19 and sheltering in place create. The fear of known danger in the form of illness and death. And the fact that the breakdown of the social contract, the fact that the expectations that the safety net will be in place, that we can rely on the government, that we can rely on the 
public agencies to maintain the infrastructures that we need for our safety and our well-being are breaking down with particular repercussions, particularly urgent repercussions for low-income people and minority people who are disproportionately affected. In the United States, we're finding that black people, brown people are disproportionately falling ill to the virus and dying disproportionately. And they are also more affected than the rest of the population by loss of income. And we are seeing extraordinary increases in the amount, in the number of people talking about hunger uh, so that uh, food banks are now uh, struggling to keep up with the demand. Next step, please. And as we think of the basic frame of what children need to be safe and the increases in the stresses that are impinging on children and families, it reminds us that it's useful to think of risk as a continuum from stress to trauma. We know that normative developmentally appropriate stress actually energizes us and strengthens our cognitive and emotional muscles. I'm reminded of a um, sign that I saw in a park bench recently that said, calm seas do not create good sailors. So normative stress can really give us the impetus. It actually brings oxygen to the brain. It gives us the impetus to cope with the challenges of everyday life and grow. For example, for a three-year-old, starting childcare can feel like choppy seas. But if we support that young child, there will be new skills that emerge as a result of that normative, predictable, moderate, developmentally appropriate stress. The stresses of COVID-19 are not normative, they're not developmentally appropriate. They can range from being manageable, from feeling like um, um, big but manageable stress, challenging certainly, but with a certain um, predictability in terms of what we can do to keep ourselves safe to dysregulated stress depending on the circumstances that the family is encountering. And at the extreme end of the continuum, it can become traumatic stress, which is what we experience when the danger is perceived as immediate and uncontrollable. And then we respond with lack of clarity in our capacity to think. We respond automatically, often by fighting, by fleeing, or by freezing, which in everyday circumstances can become manifested in becoming aggressive and reactive, in becoming avoidant of closeness in our relationships with others, or by becoming emotionally numb. Next step, please. Uh, there is another one. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the next one. And in this context, I think we need to think of what are our new roles, particularly when we cannot have the kind of easy access to the families we treat with, we treat, um, um, we, we provide treatment for, and where parents are now experiencing in the home the stresses of having to be parents 
providing 24-hour care for their children while maintaining the productivity that is expected of them from their work. And when um, it is said that those who have little now will have even less later. In these circumstances, the telehealth sessions that we can provide to children and families can become an extraordinarily important form of connection because they give the message that we are here, that we continue to remember you, that we continue to care about you, and we continue to want to help. In these situations, asking tactfully, but specifically, showing care and concern, normalizing that we are all confused about how to protect ourselves and our families, providing concrete information, providing concrete assistance with problems of living, those can be the most important interventions that we can provide to give the family a sense of having a secure base in us. And I'd like to go to the next slide, please. So that we can create a parallel process where the support that we provide from the parents can be translated in support that the parents can provide for the children. And in that process, we need to also be careful about not becoming a better parent than the parent, not preaching, but being open to the parents telling us what their concerns are and retaining our ability to evaluate for sources of danger for the parent and for the child. And we can go to the next slide, please. I'd like to emphasize that while we provide telehealth sessions, we do not relinquish the importance of trying to understand what the circumstances of the family are and how those circumstances might have changed. And particularly because of the increase in reports of domestic violence, I think we need to keep in mind both the threats to the physical safety from interpersonal relationships and the threat to the physical safety from having to abide by the new standards for washing hands, staying at home, maintaining hygiene, which can be quite difficult for families who are, for example, living in um, unstable housing conditions, in crowded conditions. And here, uh, I talked about the choppy seeds, seeds that a three-year-old might encounter going to preschool. Well, choppy seeds can become quite dangerous seeds. For example, the wave on the left can be an exciting challenge for an experienced surfer, but lethal for an average swimmer. And the wave on the right can be an exciting challenge for an average swimmer, but lethal for a young child. And this reminds us of the basic principle in trauma-informed care that a particular event can be traumatic for one person, but not for another, depending on their capacities to respond to danger. Similarly, I think COVID-19 can feel like a manageable wave for some, but like a total tsunami when it is compounded by unemployment, low income, food insufficiently, lack of access to medical care, 
and these conditions can create a very unpredictable sea of fear and despair that can overpower anybody. And as healthcare providers, we need to be able to ask again in tactful but concrete ways about the circumstances of the family, how have they changed, and then use the answers to create a realistic intervention plan. The next slide, please. The other principle, as we remember the basics, is that the past is never dead. It's not even past, as William Faulkner said, and that we need to continue to link reality, emotions, and behavior by remembering everything we know about the families that we're working with. Because we bring all of who we are to a particular present trauma, including what happened to us as we were growing up. Trauma is a lot like asthma. Current exposure triggers reminders of past exposure and leads to an increase in symptoms. We can think of it as a triangle that links our adverse childhood experiences, the so-called ACEs that happened to us with our current distress. And as many of you know, many of the leading causes of mortality and morbidity have their origin in things that happened to us when we were growing up in a cumulative way. And in recognition of this and the public health implications of this link between past and present, the California Surgeon General, Nadine Burke Harris, this past January launched a statewide initiative to apply this important insight to screening for ACEs in the medical population in California, because there is an increasing realization that helping families understand the connection between their past adversities and their current health problems can engage them in their own treatment to reduce self-harming behaviors and increase health and well-being. Next step, please. This then leads us to the question of how to give meaning to behavior, even in the context of telehealth. And I will give you an example. We continue to use the lens of normative themes and the lens of normative anxieties. And we continue to remember the context in which the family operates. Last week, we were doing a session of child parent psychotherapy with a father and his five-year-old daughter. And the father in a previous individual session had told us that his girlfriend had become pregnant. Unexpected, but certainly something that happens often, and that he had told his daughter about this pregnancy and that he wanted us to talk about this in the joint session that we were going to have in telehealth. The clinician prepared herself for this um, expectation that the parent had and in the session, the father said to the child, so how do you feel about, let's call her Mariana, being pregnant? I told our clinician that she's pregnant and suddenly the screen went blank because the child had started playing with the camera and turning it off. And we could hear the father 
saying to the child, stop playing with the camera. What are you doing? And kind of struggling with her as she kept trying to keep the camera dark and as he kept trying to put it back on. And the clinician said, Gloria, could it be that you are not quite ready to talk now about the pregnancy, that you are not quite ready to talk about a new baby? And Gloria said, can we play now? This gives us a sense of how this child was using very creatively the venues that telehealth gave her to do the equivalent of turning her back to us or going to hide behind the, cou the couch to say, give me more time. I am not quite ready. I need to process this myself. And as the clinician asked Gloria, the father realized that this was his agenda and the session moved towards playing. And then the clinician said, are you going to be ready to talk about the new baby sometime? And the little girl said, now I'm ready. And she said, I am happy. And the father said, I'm glad that you are happy. Are you only happy? And the child said, will you still love me? And that led to a very moving scene between father and child, where the child embraced, the father embraced the child and said, you will always be my Gloria. I'm telling you this story because we keep being so overwhelmed by the level of intimacy that is possible through telehealth. And in the next slides, I am going to keep giving you examples. This was a very lovely example. At the same time, we know that there are also changes in parent-child relationships in the context of chronic stress. There's impaired affect regulation. There are new negative attributions as the child might become really reactive and the parent might become reactive and they might clash with each other. The parent and the child may become new traumatic reminder, reminders to one another. And in another session that we had about two weeks ago, a four-year-old whom we'll call Kavon, started jumping on his mother's back and pummeling her. And she became very upset and said, stop hurting me. And he kept pummeling her and jumping on her back. And the clinician said, this was all in camera. And the clinician said, Kavon, your body is all jumpy and you are hitting your mom even though your mom is telling you that you are hurting her. What's happening to you? And Kavon said, George hit my mom. Here was a real life in camera disclosure of domestic violence that of course took the clinician completely by surprise, took the mother completely by surprise, and she froze. And the clinician remembered after taking a little time to get herself centered, she remembered pay attention simultaneously to what the parent might be experiencing and to what the child might be experiencing. And she said, 
Ah, now I understand. You are showing us maybe what you saw. And then she turned to the mother and said, could that be true? And the mother said, yes. George came and we started fighting and he did hit me. And then turned to George and said, and I hit him back and I shouldn't have hit him back. And George said, yes, you should hit him back. He's bad, he's bad, he's bad. And that became a conversation about how his mom was trying to protect herself that became a way of empathizing with the mother, empathizing with the child, and then a conversation of how can we make sure that George doesn't do that again? And it was followed by an individual session with the mother about safety planning and keeping the door closed if George came back again, which we continue to monitor. And this happened just two weeks ago. So this is still a situation that is unfolding. But the reason that I want to talk about it is because it gives us the message that we never know what is going to be happening in these telehealth sessions and that they are as real as it gets. Next uh, slide. I think that again, going back to basics, what Kayvon's out of control behavior was telling us was that it was a sign of traumatic stress and that moving from trying to control behavior to trying to understand the meaning of behavior, even in the context of a remote session, can lead to knowledge that is used therapeutically to advance progress in the safety and protection of the child and the parent. Next slide, please. And this in turn takes us back to another basic, which is speaking the unspeakable. Um, and a reminder of what does speaking the unspeakable be, uh, mean uh, in the context of child parent psychotherapy, but also in the context of clinical work generally which is creating a safe and respectful space to address events that are frightening, that are shameful, but they are consciously known and remembered and acknowledged. It's not going fishing for unconscious memories. It is staying with the here and now and making connections between the remembered adversities and the current distress. Um, another example of speaking the unspeakable, Kevon brought it through the language in behavior of a four-year-old. Another example that we recently had is a mother who in an individual session told us that she was having suicidal ideation because her children had been removed from her and she was now unable to see them personally in regular visits. She could only see them through telehealth, which is of course a new way that Child Protective Services is implementing visits between parents and children. And the children were feeling very dysregulated during the visits and she felt very helpless 
about her ability to contain them, to convey her love for them. And going back to the idea of assessing, the clinician immediately turned to a systematic assessing for the immediacy of the risk by conducting a suicidal evaluation on telehealth. Fortunately, this was a mom that was very conscious of the need to protect herself, of her importance to the children, and the safety plan included resources that she could make use of if she felt overwhelmed by the impulse to hurt herself, but also actual concrete strategies that she could do during the sessions with the children, including a connection with the foster parent, which she happened to know. And the clinician redefined her job as becoming a resource both for the mother and for the foster parent on behalf of the children. So here, the speaking, this unspeakable of the suicidal ideation, again, provided the impetus for constructive therapeutic intervention. Next slide, please. All of these examples, I hope, give you a sense of the importance of continuing to build a partnership by translating between the parent and the child, helping each of them understand the other's perspective, the other's experiences, keeping in mind the reality of what is happening, trying to reconcile agendas that on the face of it might seem incompatible, but which might have a similar underlying meaning of longing for protection, loving for love, loving for safety, loving for reassurance that one is doing the best one can and that these are understandable responses to a very difficult situation so that the parent can remain a protector and a socializer because of the parallel relationship where we as clinicians protect the parent and give the parent the resources to move from dysregulated traumatic stress to manageable situational stress. Next slide, please. Conflict, like stress, is ever present. And now more than ever, when we are more easily triggered, the importance of repair cannot be overstated. The idea of making up after a fight the idea of looking for safety. I think that the examples that I gave of Kayvon jumping on his mother's back and pummeling her and her being annoyed by him and then the two of them coming together around the issue of how both of them needed to be protected so that they could repair the rupture in the relationship that happened at the moment. The rapture uh, in um, the, um, another example that I have is um, of a child who kept 
enacting on camera his fear of dying by lying down on the floor and saying, I got the virus and I died. And his mother would become very, very, very dysregulated. And the clinician said to the mother, what do you think he might be trying to tell us? And the mother said to the child, Ryan, are you scared of dying? And he said, yes. And she realized that he was not just trying to annoy her, that he was trying to convey an urgent question to her. Will I die? And she said, I'm scared of dying. I'm scared of your dying. And that is why we are washing hands and we're staying home and we're doing all these things that we're doing so that we don't get sick. And then the clinician said, and children very, very seldom get sick, almost never get sick. And Ryan said, really? And the mother said, really? Oh, said Ryan. And in following sessions, the mother told us that the uh, enactment of Ryan's fear of dying had almost disappeared. So here there was also a repair in the moment through understanding the reasons that the mom was triggered, that the child was triggered, and a reconciliation. The next slide, please. Alicia, I'm going to give you a five minute. Um, Great, thank you. Five more minutes, and then we'll leave some time for questions. Yes, thank you. Um, a very primary um, principle in trauma treatment is that the first effect to regulate is our own. And the only way that we can regulate our affect is if we take care of ourselves. I think that we might be feeling so um, pressured to respond to the very urgent needs around us that it might feel hard to find ways of taking care of ourselves. I think my only unexpected emotion as I'm talking to you um, says that I'm not just talking, I'm, this is real. Um, I think that the chronic collective danger increases the risk of vicarious trauma and burnout. And I've been learning so much from my colleagues who understand about the importance of bringing mindfulness to our everyday experience and who are recommending taking small breaks throughout the day to prevent the situational stress that we are experiencing from becoming unmanageable. And we are taught by people who have made it their careers to study affect regulation, strategies for affect regulation, that as short a break as 60 to 90 seconds may suffice if we do it at intervals and if we are able to bring our attention to our body to notice the dysregulated feeling before it overpowers us and to take a little time to give it a name 
and then to engage in a strategy, in a self-care activity that engages our kindness towards ourselves. Many colleagues of mine are telling me and were telling each other that we feel guilty for not doing more to address the enormous suffering that we see around us. And we are taught by our mentors to tell ourselves that we're doing the best that we can and that we are relying on each other to create a tipping point towards goodness where we're part of a workforce that is working together and where each of us has our part within the constraints and limitations that we have, that we are good enough as we are and that we continue doing the work that we can. That in those 60 to 90 seconds, we can repeat a favorite mantra. One of mine is, you are not expected to complete the work, but neither are you allowed to refrain from it, which is from the Talmud. Many of us can go back to our spiritual traditions for sources of wisdom, say a quick prayer, go for a little walk around the room in between uh, sessions, looking at the picture of somebody we love, exchange a few words with somebody that we trust. Anything will do, depending on who we are, what the setting is, what our frame of mind is at the moment. And the main thing is to remember that stress is an automatic physiological response and that bringing awareness and consciousness to it interrupts the automatic nature of it and redirects it to conscious awareness so that we can take aware action to protect ourselves and in the context of protecting ourselves, we can protect others and remain available to those who need us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, you have so many good wishes here in the chats. Um, um, I'll read you a few of them. Okay, somebody wrote that she's so appreciative of your heart and mind. Thank you for talking about this from such a personal perspective. Um, uh, you're such a beautiful human teacher and caregiver, Alicia. Thank you for all that you do and give. Love this, we are good enough as we are. Sharing your knowledge and heart and compassion have lifted my spirits. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing your wise words and humanity and so on and so forth. That's thank what we're getting in the chats much. here. <laughs> So thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a privilege to be talking with you. Now I want to ask if anybody would like to write a question for Alicia in the chat. Um, we will make sure that she gets this whole chat to her, uh, onto her afterwards <laughs> with all of your good wishes also. Okay, so here we have one question from Jordan. If you have any recommendations about managing issues with self-harm and cutting via teletherapy. Uh, teletherapy. And she's talking about an adolescent young lady, 17 years old. It's interesting. Thank you so much for asking this question. Um, I am not an expert in adolescence, and we are taught not to practice beyond the scope of our competence, right? That is one of the, of the basics also. But um, from my colleagues that talk about um, who are experts in adolescence, I understand that the DPT uh, principles of acceptance and containing and uh, self-care work well with adolescents 
and that the question again and again uh, i am not an expert i am just giving you the basics that i've learned and i, I think a lot depends on that big wave that i was talking about before who is this adolescent what do you know about her let's say and what are the sources of support that this child might have that can be brought to bear but also bringing awareness to when does it happen what triggers it and can she catch herself right before she does it and do something that is going to change her internal frame from the impulse to cut to another activity that will protect her. One example that I just heard about recently in talking with a colleague was that um, an adolescent was very, very lethargic during a telehealth uh, session and the clinician became very worried about had she overdosed on something and asked to speak with the parents who were in the, in the, in the home. And the parents said, no, she just goes to bed very late and then she gets up very early. And the clinician said, could you please go to her room or look around and see whether there is anything that worries you? And they went to her room and they found pills with an open bottle that she had taken so that they immediately called 911 and she was essentially saved. And I think that this gives you an example of how on a clinician might have to be during a session to think on her toes about alternatives to safety that can be mobilized in the moment. Thank you for the question, and I hope it serves as an impetus for learning from those who are experts in adolescence and in cutting. I have another question here, a, a personal question and a sad question. I'm going to read it. I recently lost my four-year-old son, and I have noticed since we have been isolated that his three-year-old brother is asking more questions and expressing his feelings more about his brother being gone. Do you have any suggestions on how I can help him and still protect myself from emotional breakdown? Bless you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for whoever wrote that. Bless you, bless you. I'm so sorry. I think your three-year-old and I just want to say I was in that situation myself as a young child. And so I'm speaking to you from the perspective of what I learned. I think he needs so much from you to know that you also miss your son, your little one's brother. At three, there is such a need to understand what death is. And talking about what it means is that the body cannot move, that one cannot breathe, etc. But that the love remains and that you will always remember and love and think of the child and enable, give permission to the extent that you can for photographs, for telling stories about when they were together for, I, I think it might heal you 
as you help heal him. And I realize that words are not enough for such a tragedy and such a loss. And at the same time, words and actions of being together, holding each other and explaining and being present is all we have. All my best to you. Thank you. I'm going to have one more question. Whoever, I just want to say, I see that everybody is very moved here when I, whoever has the pictures on, the video on. Um, uh, Jordan Westbrook has raised her hand. I don't see her on the screen, but if you want to open your mic and ask a question. Jordan? Okay, I see that that did not work. Okay, does anybody else want to open their mic and say something or write something? Jordan did write, I see here that she been that she was the one that wrote about the 17 year old girl. Am I right about that? Yes. Okay, so she added about what you wrote about the cutting that she's been working on goal setting and problem solving along with following her safety plan and that she also encouraged the mom to limit access to lethal means and limit access to her meds. So there's a response to your first question. Okay, um, uh, whoever is interested in CEUs, please stay on, don't go yet. Okay, Haruv USA will talk about that, but before then, Alicia, this was a very moving and very helpful session. Um, I think I speak for everybody pretty much when I say that. You have people, whoever is clapping their hands in their pictures. Thank you so much for coming and being with us here. And we wish you great health. Thank you. Safety. I wish great health to all of you. Thank you, Paula, always for your partnership. Having this connection is very meaningful to me. Yes, thank you me. all. Be well. OK, thank you very Bye. much. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Um, Christina Gall, CEUs. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Christina. I'm the GRA for Heruv USA, and I'm going to be doing CEUs for you guys. So after yesterday, we made a couple of adjustments just to make the process go faster. I had some people ask me for certificates of attendance. The answer is yes, we can give those to all of you, and we will send those out to all of you. What I need from all of you, if you did not register or you did not register initially for CEUs, I need you to put your first and last name and email address in the chat. If you did register for this online and said that you needed CEUs, I already have all of your information, so you don't have to put it in there. And basically what's going to happen after this is I'm going to send all of you an evaluation form. And the instruction is for you guys to fill it out and forward it to Diane Freeman who is in charge of the CEUs at the University of Oklahoma. And then once she receives your evaluation, she will send you your CEU. It should be quick. It should be within a couple of days. She does a lot of this and she's really good at it. So she'll get it to you as fast as possible. And that's pretty much it for CEUs. Yeah, and did, every, did everybody understand that? I hope that everybody understood that, um, yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I, just, I just want uh, to say that if you registered uh, through the link to this lecture, please do not put your name because it makes such a hard work for us. So only if you did not register and you got your link from someone else. So only in this situation, write your name and email and the word CEUs. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to close. I hope you're all looking at our schedule. We have a good couple of weeks ahead of us with really excellent lectures and excellent lectures. In the meantime, stay safe and stay healthy. And we'll, I hope to see you again soon on the screen. Bye bye. Christina? Yes. I am leaving this open, okay? All right, thank you. Bye. Good luck. Thanks.